So for those of you who haven't yet met me, my name is Dr. Alai, and I'm the scholar in residence here at the Holocaust Center for the academic year. I see some familiar faces. I also see some new faces. So let me just give you all a brief overview of what we've been exploring this semester, because this is actually our final event of the colloquium series looking at complicity and collaboration. Let me also um, mention to all of you, we have uh, handouts in the back for different articles that our speaker would like you to take a look at. We also have our questionnaires that we encourage you to fill out for the end of the event. I personally am also doing research where I'm interested in getting student feedback about how participation with the NEH series has impacted your experience this semester at QCC. The minimal requirement is just coming to one event, which all of you are present for this event. So for those students who are willing to dedicate 20 to 30 minutes of your time to be interviewed, there's a sign-in sheet in the back. I just ask for your name and email address, and I'll contact you, and we can could have a chat for about 20 to 30 minutes. Perhaps your professors will offer you extra credit for that, so let them know that I encourage that. So um, I just want to thank some of the people here at the center before we get started, as this is the final time I'll be at the podium as the scholar in residence. I'm not sure how many of you know that we um, lost our director uh, mid-semester, Dan Lashem, that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, he relocated to Florida, so um, he hasn't been here since since April. And so Marissa Hollywood, our assistant director, and um, Victoria Fernandez and Allison Belfour, our um, assistant staff, has been very, very integral to helping um, the center seamlessly transition without a director in place right now. So it truly does take a village, and they've done an excellent job. So most of you probably didn't even realize we don't have a director right now. But yeah, we wish Dan well, but he relocated with his family to Florida. So. Um, what I wanted to share with everyone is we've been exploring this theme of complicity and collaboration. My background, I'm a social psychologist, so when I look at mass violence and atrocities such as genocide and the Holocaust, I've always been interested in understanding it from the perspective of individuals. Normal people, neighbors, colleagues, um, friends, peers, how do they react when injustice is occurring? And what decisions can we make as individuals to either resist tyranny or injustice? Or unfortunately, as is oftentimes the case in the buildup to genocide, what might we be doing to facilitate greater violence and escalation of atrocities? So that was really the impetus for the theme of complicity and collaboration. And we thought that we would end on a more positive note by talking about peace education today. So I'm going to introduce our speaker shortly. But um, one of the things that you'll notice on and the handout that's from his Center for Teaching Peace is in the corner, there's this little quote that says, unless we teach our children peace, someone else will teach them violence. So peace education and uh, peace building is really the most significant tools that we have to resist the tyranny that can escalate into genocide and to counteract a lot of forces for evil within the society and culture. And I just want to share, I've had the opportunity to meet Coleman multiple times at different conferences. If you get an opportunity to stick around after the event and talk to him, he's got great stories that he can share with you. Uh, sounds like he's been an agitator for most of his career, and I mean that as the biggest compliment. And he has great stories that he can share um, in terms of he's been a journalist, a professor, a peace activist, uh, very, very significant voice 
voice in uh, the peace education community. So I think we have a lot to learn today. So let me give you some background. Our speaker is Coleman McCarthy. As I mentioned, he's a journalist. He's been writing for the Washington Post since the 1970s. He is a pacifist, a vegetarian, and an athlete who has run 18 marathons, including in Boston and New York. I didn't know that. That's really impressive. Um, in addition to journalism, he is a teacher. Since 1982, he has had more than 10,000 students in his courses on nonviolence. I actually, when I lived in DC, I met Coleman, and I don't even know if you remember this. He told me I teach a class at the American University Law School. I met him at a conference, and I actually lived at that time very, very close to AU. And he said, come by any time to one of my classes. This is when we meet. I don't think that you realized I was going to take you up on that. So I actually showed up to one of his classes at the law school, and uh, the entire class period was dedicated to Gandhi and nonviolent resistance. So yeah, it was, a, it was a really great class. His students were so engaged, and I learned so much when I joined the class there. He currently teaches at two high schools. Uh, as I mentioned, American University, the University of Maryland and Georgetown University Law Schools, so a lot of these elite schools in the Maryland, D.C. area. And he's not a typical teacher. Uh, in his high school classes, he gives no homework. Uh, he gives... <laughs> he gives no exams. He gives <laughs> no tests. Um, and actually, before the event, he was sharing with me, because I said to him, you know, for academia, you probably have been, you know, an agitator. Did you ever get resistance from the administration where you teach? And he actually told me a story about how in the 80s, the president of American University tried to oust him as a teacher there because he gave all the students A's. It's a fascinating story. He can tell it better than me. But essentially, what ended up happening is his students applied the tactics of nonviolent resistance and boycotting to make sure that he would stay on as faculty at American University. And he's since been identified as a very prominent, what did you tell me, faculty of the year as an adjunct at AU recently? So they really like him at American University. But um, he received resistance early on because his approach in the classroom is very different than how we're trained to be as faculty. Um, he believes in the purity of learning and um, to take out artificial pressures and, the, and fear um, from the education process for students. He's the director of the Center for Teaching Peace, so a number of the articles that you got from um, the front there, some of them are from um, publications. Uh, this is a center in DC, look it up, it's a great resource. If there's any faculty who's here, I've used a lot of the articles that they published to introduce my students to peace education. This is a nonprofit that helps students and schools to get peace study programs into their curriculum. He's the author of six Six books on peace and social justice, and they're used as course texts at hundreds of high schools and colleges. So please welcome a good friend, Coleman McCarthy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aji, for that nice welcome. I am thrilled to be here at the Kupferberg Center. And I did meet Aji a couple of times in Washington, and I was always enlivened by that. So I'll have a good talk tonight. We'll have a plenty of discussion disagreement and dissent. I like people who disagree with me. I really have no choice in my line of work as a left-wing journalist. I get a fair amount of mail from readers around the country who call me a fool, jerk, know-nothing, ignorant, stupid person. And then I read my negative mail. Uh, everybody get that little joke? All right, there's always a few slow ones that miss the jokes. We got to wake them up. Uh, and so we will, um, I want to hear your views about your lives, what you're doing with your talents and gifts. It might be helpful before we begin to take a few moments of silence or reflection or prayer, if you believe in prayer. Some people do and some don't. And remember, all the people today on this odd little planet of ours, which Ernest Hemingway, in one of his better days, called a third-rate rock, is spinning around the second-rate sun. That's the planet Earth. 
And remember the people today who have been, are, or will be victimized by violence, whether military violence, emotional violence, environmental violence, verbal violence, prison violence, handgun violence, assault weapon violence, sexual violence, anti-Semitic violence, homophobic violence, political violence, religion-based violence, domestic violence, academic violence, medical violence, obstetrical violence, and violence towards the animals. Let's take a few moments of silence, reflection, and or prayer, and reflect on really what's going on on this little odd planet of ours, and what our obligations are to reduce that violence, no matter what kind it is. And there's about, I just mentioned, maybe 20 or so types of violence. Take a few moments of silence or reflection. All right, thank you for that. It's good to do so in these, in these busy times of our overscheduled and, and make work busy lives to step back a little bit and really figure out what gifts do we have. As a journalist, as Ozzie mentioned, I've been very lucky to have interviewed many of the world's great peacemakers. I've interviewed Desmond Tutu from South Africa, Mayrid Corgan from Belfast, Sean McBride from Dublin, Ireland, Perez Esquivel from Buenos Aires, Mother Teresa, the great saint from Calcutta, Rigoberta Menchu, as I said, from Guatemala, Perez Esquivel from Buenos Aires, and Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. What do they all have in common? They all won the Nobel Peace Prize. And I'd always asked them, when I interviewed them as a journalist, I would ask them, how do we go about increasing peace and decreasing violence, which ought to be the purpose of our lives, if you seek a life of purpose? The answer always came back pretty much the same. You need to go where people are, because people keep having conflicts and solving them either through violent force or nonviolent force. No third option. So I thought the advice was sound. I took her to a high school near my office at the Washington Post and asked the principal, I'd like to come in and teach a class and call it Peace Studies, Alternatives to Violence. And she said, well, we don't have a class like that here, but if you want to give it a try, come on in. One little problem, though, she said, we are a poor school. We can't afford to pay you. I said, I didn't come here for money. I came here to figure out how can we increase peace and decrease violence. So the class began. It's not a very difficult course to teach. You read the literature of peace. And you read some Gandhi, King, Merton, Day, Musty, Jesus, Francis, Amos, Tolstoy, Einstein, Buddha, Sojourner Truth, Adam Ballou, George Fox, Howard Zinn, Daniel Berrigan, and Philip Berrigan on the first day. And then we really get into it. <laughs> and after I rattle off those names, someone always hops up, how did you ever hear of all those people? How come we haven't heard of them? You haven't heard of them for an obvious reason. You have been going to conventional schools where we teach everything but about how to be a peacemaker. Can I back up that claim? Well, there are two questions. How many of you went to a high school where they offered you courses in peace studies. Hands? One, there we are from Churchill High School. Very good, Ozzy. One person, if this was a peace-loving society, every hand would have gone up. Second question, how many of you went to a high school where they required you to take algebra and geometry? <laughs> All hands go up. So there's a good chance you graduate from high school as peace illiterates. 
but we made sure you get out of high school knowing all about pi r square and bonkazoids and crankazoids and darkazoids and lonazoids and hemorrhoids and apoids for the deep thinkers. Who cares? Have you ever been out on a date with your sweetheart? And it's a nice moonlit night and you start to have these feelings and you walk along the great Atlantic Ocean, warm breeze, and you lean over to your loved one and say, I've got to tell you something. I've been waiting for this moment. I am deeply in love with algebra. <laughs> Have you ever done that? If you have, you need to be in therapy, okay? But go see a psychiatrist. You've got a serious problem. So we don't teach it to you. And then, we, and then you wonder why we have so much hatred and killing in the world. We don't teach you the alternatives. And it's not just the, the military violence. Uh, I think one out of five women will be sexually assaulted on an American campus uh, during the college years. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of action going on now. Uh, the Me Too movement, we've been waiting a long time for it. It's finally coming. And the men like Bill O'Reilly, Matt Lauer, Al Franken, they're all being held accountable. It's about time. And the women have been victimized way too long. And so that is one also. One issue is we live in a very... I want to pass these books around. These are the ones we use for my courses. And take a look at these. This one is called Solutions to Violence. And it has uh, 16 chapters with essays in here. And this one is called Strength Through Peace. Now, our government says the opposite, peace through strength. They mean peace through violence. So I'll pass these around. You have a very militarized economy, as you may know, and it, it affects all of us because most of you, many of you, are graduating from college uh, at American University, where I teach. The average student debt is about oh, about sixty thousand dollars. At Georgetown Law School, it's over one hundred twenty thousand. Just getting out of the gate. And we have a military budget that's out of control. And uh, we, the military budget is now about $720 billion a year. That number's too large to grasp. You've got to break it down. It comes down to about $2.4 billion a day, still too large to grasp. It comes down to $25,000 a second. $25,000. $25,000, $25,000. Will someone please stop me? $25,000. Someone please stop me? $25,000. I can't stop. I'm addicted. There it is. Martin Luther King, we just had this celebration of his, of his, of, of his 50 year death. King gave, does anybody know where he gave his final and last Sunday morning sermon? He was killed on a Thursday. He gave his last sermon in Washington, a mile, from, a mile from my home. And in that talk, he said, the essay's in this book right here, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military programs than programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. We don't tell you that king. We gave you the safe, sanitized king. The king who says, we shall overcome, I have a dream. They always drag out that one. They never tell you about this speech. And on the next page, he says, the world's most violent government is my own. There's a big monument next time you go to Washington. There's a big monument to King that has, I think, I think 14 quotes in marble. You will not see either of those two quotes I just mentioned. They give you the seek justice quotes. That's the safe King. He died very much disappointed because he was criticized from the left that thought he was over his head. The New York Times criticized him for being a lightweight. 
The Washington Post, you know nothing about foreign policy. Uh, 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 stick to having your little dream. So the money is involved, and I just want to show you this graphic right here. This is what they call a visual. Does everybody see what it is? Right there on the red. And the red part is the, is the military budget. And on the right side is the domestic budget uh, for programs. So 59% of the federal income tax goes to military programs. On the right side, health and human services get 6% of the federal spending. The State Department gets 4%. Education gets 4%. That's why King was angry, because he knew what we were doing, wasting our money. Those of you who are still in college, all your lives we've been at war. Since 1991, we invaded Iraq. And then we went and invaded Afghanistan. We are still there. We are in a, a state of permanent war. Just yesterday, about 50 people were killed by a, a suicide bomb in Afghanistan, we were, where we have soldiers. We have troops in about 140 military bases around the world. No other government is close to that. And we've been waging constant wars one after the other. And who are the ones that declare the wars? Well, the members of Congress. How many of you had grandparents who maybe were sent to Vietnam? Anybody? Maybe a few. Vietnam War was in 63 to 75. There are 535 members of Congress. How many do you think had sons who saw combat in Vietnam? Out of 535 in 14 years, only one, the only one. George W. Bush was off the Vietnam War, but he didn't go. Donald Trump was for the war. He had a, he had a sore foot, so he couldn't make it. Well, let's, send, let's send somebody else to go. Dick Cheney, vice president, he didn't go. And you have to wonder, OK, they didn't go. Who went in their place? Somebody had to. 40% of the casualties in Vietnam were African American. 40%. You, you get a deferment from college. So that is a part of our background. But we don't teach that king to you. And we put academic pressure on you real early. Learn how to compete. Competition is good. And what is the ultimate form of competition? It's war. That's all wars are. And we teach you real early how to compete. Did you ever go to an elementary school where the teacher said, OK, students, we're going to play musical chairs? Did you ever play musical chairs? Gather around, knock somebody over? Push them down, feel good when they trip. And after you do that, after, after you knock enough people over, then we take you, OK, children, we're going to have a spelling bee. Have you ever had a spelling bee in class? OK, little Billy, spell cat for us. Little Billy think, well, that's a tough one, cat. Mm, T, C, A, cat. Everybody starts laughing, little Billy. And teacher says, Billy, sit down, you're stupid. He goes back 20 years later with an assault weapon. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you how stupid I am. And then we go outside to the playground. Now we have a tug of war. Pull him into the mud. How about having a tug of peace? <laughs> so we teach how to compete. And that's what our foreign policy is all about, compete for the oil, compete for the food, Every day, there's about, I, I think, I think 21,000 people, some number like that, that die of hunger and starvation. 
And it goes on and on. I'm a teacher real early. So there's two types of violence in the world. There's hot and cold violence. Hot is when you see it up close, you feel it, it's emotional. That was 9-11. That was the school massacres. We saw a couple of those recently. And then you have cold violence. Out of sight, we're unaware of it. The media ignores, but it's the same. That's executions on death row. That's killing animals for food. We don't see how they're slaughtered every day. It's also, we don't see the victims of, of domestic violence all too often, but it's the same. But we call it hot and cold. In my classes, I always, I always tell the students, I always ask them, I'm sure if I asked you right now, how many of you want to make a difference? I'm sure all heads would go up. Well, how do you make a difference? You start being different and break away from this culture that, that glorifies and sanctifies violence in all its forms. I want to ask a little question, if I may. Who would like to reduce cruelty in the world? Hands up, please. Everybody, all right. Who would like to reduce global warming? Everybody's hand goes up. All right. Who would like to reduce poverty in the world? All hands rise. Good. Who would like to have a healthy body? All hands go up. We're doing well. And who would like to save some money? All hands go up. What's that? Okay. Five for five. So how do we do it? Who can guess the three words? Stop eating meat. Stop eating meat. What's that guy? What's the, what do you mean? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, the animals are killed very cruelly. You ever see movies about factory farming? It's, it's horrible. But it's out of sight. And we have, we, we are deliberately unaware. It's called willful ignorance. Don't tell me about it. I don't want to know. Then we figure I'm complicit. Because when you buy meat, you tell them, keep killing them. It's OK. 70% of the corn in America is fed to animals. 70%. And then there's about 11, I think, I think what, 21,000 people dying of hunger every day. And we're feeding the animals, and then we get heart disease because high cholesterol, and, and the cycle goes on. Is that large book going around? I want to read something to you. There was, uh, could you just bring it up to me for a second? There was a wonderful rabbi. Uh, uh, thanks, that's it, thank you. He was a, a um, um, it's on page 127 in our book. His name was, I just want to read an excerpt to you, if I may. Um, his name was Edgar Akupfer Akoperwitz. And he was in a concentration camp in Dachau during the Holocaust. And he wrote a wonderful essay. He survived the camp. And he wrote an essay called Animals, My Brethren. And there's a long essay, but one of the quotes in here is, I refuse to eat animals because I cannot nourish myself on their sufferings and by the death of other creatures. I refuse to do so because I suffered so painfully myself in the concentration camp that I can feel the pain of others by recalling my own suffering. So that's an option we all have to make. We can, we can talk all we want about, about lowering the military budget. That's fine. We can talk about doing away with the death penalty, which is good. 
but we can't do much about that, but we can do something about, about our next meal. So I decided in high school that I grew up like you did, loving animals. Well, if I love them, why am I hiring someone to kill them? But the way they kill them is way far away, so we're deliberately unaware of it. So that's something you might think about. I'm not, I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty of eating a Big Mac, but just think a little bit about it, because we have enormous power and we don't realize it. The trouble is, though, we put so much pressures on you in school um, that you learn how to cope with school. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you think back to all the years you were in school? How many can raise your hand now and say, I never, ever cheated in school? Let me hear you, let me hear you say it, good friend. One person, all right? Second question, who has cheated in school? Ah, uh, that's the great American way. Ah, uh, yeah, now you go get a job at Citibank, they're hiring. But gentlemen, put it on your resume. I know how to cheat, you have a sure job. <laughs> and why do we cheat, do you think? I uh, tell me, Ernesto, why, uh, tell us about your cheating experiences. It's just a, it's a hard test, and everybody else feels it's hard, and we're all like agreeing to cheat with each other. Go up and tell the teacher, I don't learn by taking tests. <laughs> I learn by being kind to people. I learn by being generous to people. I learn experientially. So you cheat for one word. It's called fear. If I don't get that A, something bad's gonna happen to me. So, so you start cheating a little bit here, a little bit there. Just go tell the teacher, I don't learn by taking tests or doing homework. I believe in home thinking. If a teacher does a good job for you, you'll think about it long after. If they don't do a good job, forget it. So we have a very high anxiety school system. Yes? I just wanted to ask you as a younger person, did you ever cheat? Oh, no. I failed algebra. I failed geometry. I failed physics. I, 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 started, I was going to fail anyway. Why cheat? I was going to fail anyway. Why cheat? I, 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 I didn't do it. What's your, uh, did you do any cheating? Uh, did you do any cheating? I said to you, I failed with cheating, yes. Math was never my thing. I had a purpose for cheating. Yes, uh, yes, good, there you are. Uh, I worry about people who make too many A's in school. Because you can make all A's and go out and fail at life. I've seen it happen so many times. I gotta get that A. Mom and Dad tell you now, don't disgrace the family with a little C average. And we talk about your GPA. What, what does GPA mean, uh, Janessa? A grade point average. I don't think so. I think GPA means give parents appreciation. Go pet animals. GPA. Grow pretty apples. GPA. Goofs putter along. GPA. And as he uh, give professors applause. Uh, those are the real GPAs that matter. Uh, the, uh, the rest, we just, you know what goes on in school, we process you as though you're slabs of processed cheese going to Velveeta High School on to Mozzarella University and Cheddar Grad School. How was that for a cheesy metaphor? Was it not uh, well-crafted? All right, did everybody get that one? Come on, slow ones, come on, slow ones. Pick it up, pick up the speed now. Uh, so that's what goes on in our school. It's hard to break away from it all. Hard to do it here at the cheese factories. And I have a little rule in my classes. Don't ask questions. Don't dare ask me a question. Instead, do something much braver, much bolder, much more resilient. 
question the answers. What answers? The ones you get from our governments that says, kill people, we'll have peace in the world. Uh, keep eating animals, keep executing on death row. We'll finally have justice in the world. So you know, we have to question abuse of authority. And by the way, speaking of abuse of authority, Trump has said a lot, uh, Donald Trump has said a lot of ignorant things. In fact, the Washington Post had a long story. They, they went and found out all the lies. He's, he's lied over 2,000 times. They documented 2,000 lies. And he told another one the other night when he gave a talk out, I think, in Ohio. And, and this will hit home right here. He said, and nobody knows what a community college is. Can you imagine saying an ignorant thing like that? When this little college right here is, do, is doing so much for so many people, and you know what a community college is. For many of you, it's, it's been a big asset in your lives. And there he was making this another, another ignorant comment. So people always ask, well, what can I do to be a peacemaker? I always, I do, I do believe in homework. I always give homework. Go tell someone you love them. That's your homework tonight. And if you can't find someone to tell them that you love them, what should you do? Look a little harder. And if you still can't find them, call me up. I know where all the homeless people are. The unloved people, they're everywhere. And sometimes even, even a member of your own family's gone through some hard times, climbing a few hills. And a kind word or a smile may be much. I remember interviews your mother, I remember inter interviewing Mother Teresa one time, and I was kind of feeling a little bit uh, not getting anywhere with my, with my, with my goals to make it a peaceful world. And she had a wonderful line. She said, "Don't ever worry about being successful. Worry about being faithful." faithful to our ideals, our commitments, and to be peacemakers. Uh, and then she also said, uh, very few of us will ever be called on to do great things, but all of us can do small things in a great way. I teach, I teach at two high schools in Washington. One's a very poor school. One's a very wealthy school. And I bring into the wealthy school classes, I bring in a friend of mine named Lily Flores. Lily's from El Salvador. She fled that. Is anybody from El Salvador in background? A few folks are. There you are. When did your grandparents leave El Salvador? In the mid a little after the 1980s? Yeah, after the Civil War. So Lily fled. She never went past the sixth grade. She made her way up to this country and became a migrant worker in South Florida, picking tomatoes and cucumbers. It was, it was hard work, a sun, the sun up, sun down, low pay, a mean field bosses. She lasted about a year, made her way up to Washington, and got a job at this high school where I've been teaching as a volunteer for a long time. Lily's one of the invisible people at the school. Her job is to clean toilet bowls. We have 16 bathrooms in the school. Lily's in them all day. The students rarely talk to her. They don't know her name. She's invisible almost. So I bring her into my class. Lily, come tell your story. And she's, she's, our English is good. It's, it's picking up. And she talked about being a migrant worker and working in the bathrooms. And there was one student that day, her name was Hannah. I'll never forget her. She was the only one that day who took notes from Lily's talk. You could tell they were both connecting with each other. The only one taking notes. So the end of the day came, school bell rings, everybody rushes out to go play sports, go to the chess club meeting, gotta be there for the chess club meeting, the deep thinkers. And everybody left that day except one student, 
And that was Hannah. Where did she go, do you think? She went to find Lily and found her in one of the bathrooms and said, Lily, give me a mop. I want to help clean the floor with you. She helped Lily that day, the next day, and many days after. And Hannah's friends said, why, why are you hanging around with the help? I'm learning from her a lot more than I am in most of my classes. They bonded. Where did Hannah go that summer, do you think? She went to El Salvador to go back to Lily's little village and to see what was happening. Hannah went on to Tufts University, which has a wonderful peace studies program, and just received a law degree from New York University as a public interest immigration lawyer, largely because of Lily. He woke her up and shook her up. And I tell you that story, so make sure here at the campus that you thank the workers, the people that cook your food for you, that, that cuts the grass and heats the buildings. They're the people that have done something to your lives. I think gratitude is a very, a very great virtue. And we all ought to be remindful of that. And make sure you thank your parents. If you're having some trouble with them, that's okay. That's okay. Tell them you love them. I want to do a little quiz. I will have some time for a few questions and answers and comments and disagreements. I want to call out about, oh, maybe five or six names. And if you know the names of these people, I have a little prize for you. I want you to tell me who they are, where they're from, what they did, and what they're well known for. And whoever gets all the names correct, I have a little prize for you. How much should I make the prize for? A dollar? Ten dollars. Think bigger, brother. Think bigger. Think bigger. Anissa, how much? A hundred? You got it. You got it. Wow. Easy, brother. Easy. It's real. It's real. Okay. This is any student here. Okay. First name. Who is Robert E. Lee? Robert E. Lee. No student knows Robert E. Lee? Tell us, brothers. Yeah, tell us. Yes. Yes. Yeah, very, give, him, give him a nice round of applause. Very nice. All right. All right. All right. One for one. All right. You're all still in the game. I'm a very lenient grader. Uh, next name. Who is, let's go international now. Who is Napoleon? Napoleon. Way in the back, tell us. Um, he was French. <laughs> Good. Uh, he tried, he was from Spain and he tried to take over most of the uh, everything. Uh. <laughs> everything, yes. Yes, a very, a very good answer. Okay. Okay, we're all we're all two for two, right? We're still in the game, all the students. A French general. Yes, that's it. Let's go back home now. Who was Ulysses S. Grant? All right, tell us. Yes, very good. Nice going, sister. Nice going. Nice going. Okay, we're three for three. Three to go. It's looking good. Party time. Next name. Who is Barbara Lee? Not Robert E.'s wife. Not Robert E.'s wife. No hands on Barbara Lee. If this was an educated society, a peace-loving society, every hand would have gone up. So who was she? Well, she was a young African-American woman, born in El Paso, Texas, at age 18, had two babies by two different men, both of whom abandoned her. It didn't look promising. So she managed to get out of Texas went to Oakland, California, and there she went to college called Mills College, a women's only college, up across the bay from Berkeley. And she got a degree in social work because she, she knew people needed help. Social workers are usually caring people. And, and it's a wonderful profession to go into. 
So she did that, and then she, she got a job working for a congressman, a member of Congress named Ronald Dellums, whose name is on, on my advisory board. You can look it up in a little sheet of paper I gave you. Ron Dellums was a very progressive member of the House. He retired, and Barbara Lee said, I'm going to run for his seat. No one gave her a chance, but she fooled him, and she won. And came to Congress, I think about 2001, one of the first votes when she came to Congress was to whether we should go to Iraq, invade Iraq. In the Senate, the vote was 98 to zero. Unanimous, let's go kill somebody. 9-11 was on a Tuesday. 9-14 was when they had to vote in Congress, on Friday. In the House, the vote was 420 to one. Anybody want to guess who the one was? Dear Barbara Lee. You can look it up. Just Google her name for Barbara Lee's 914 speech. It all just a three, uh, just a three minute talk. And there it was. And we don't know about her. We could have a whole semester on Barbara Lee's life and times. She's still in Congress, still there. You can write a nice paper about her. And she's, I think she's the only member of Congress right now who is ever on welfare and food stamps. And by the way, this administration is trying to cut back on food stamps. Make them go get a job, these lazy, shiftless people. Uh, just, uh, just so transparent. As though, as, as though poverty is the result of laziness. It's also unforeseen circumstances, illness, family problems. Okay, we didn't know Barbara Lee. Next name. Who is Jeanette Rankin? No hands on Jeanette Rankin. Well, she was the first member of Congress who was a woman. Took a long time before the boys let some, let some of the sisters come in. She's on the back of our little book right here. She's from Montana. And it says, you can no more win a war than win an earthquake. One of the great lines in US history. That was in 1941. She was the only member of Congress to vote against going to war with the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. She also was one of the few members in the First World War who, who opposed going to Europe. And we don't know about her. All right, we have one to go, right? Who is Joan Baez? Joan Baez. She's a folk singer who sings blues. Indeed. Indeed. Well, we have it right in here in our book. We have. She's been a long-time family friend of mine, and I've known her for a, she's one of the great peacemakers of all time. And she said, somebody recently asked me if I had ever had any doubts about how, how, how I've lived my life, if I, had ever thought to myself, I'm uncertain about everything that I've done before in my life. I don't know what, I don't know about everything that I believed in. I never thought about that before. But when I reflected on it, I realized that I never had any doubts. I've just done what I believed in. That's what it's all about. A lot of people talk great ideas, but don't put them into practice. So those are a few thoughts about it. Listen, don't feel bad about failing the quiz, okay? It's always safe money. I've never lost it. I, I, I have never any fears. <laughs> I've even done this before professors' conferences where the, where the, where the PhDs, I and mean, we love them when they come together. They all, they, they, you know, we should take back their PhDs, don't you think? Uh, 
Not starting with yours now, uh, Ozzy. <laughs> I know the answers now. I couldn't know that the first time you did it. Uh, I, I know. <laughs> I carefully said any students here, okay? I know, I know, I know you're a ringer, okay? You were, you were ready to pounce. So if there are any comments or questions, we could take a few of those now um, about the issues of the day. Good. Um, I, I don't agree with everything you said. I agree with much of it, but not everything. Excellent. And, and I wonder, I, I do like Wells highly slaughtered meat, um, and I found places where that happens. Um, I also think, I want to challenge you, and maybe the students can help. I think this is an easy <laughs> audience because you're speaking to the choir. And I'd like to hear what you would say if you were at a university that was populated by white, by white supremacists. Sorry, did everybody hear that? <laughs> well, I would, I don't think I would alter my talk. I would, I would, I would, um, I, I believe everybody is, a diff is in a different stage of enlightenment. You are, I am, and I think those people who, who are anti-Semitic, who are Nazis, okay, figure out how did, how did they get that way? It has to be a reason. I believe in the five E's. If you want to figure out someone's behavior, there are five words beginning with the letters E. Your education, what type of education was it? Was it experiential or theoretical? Your emotions, can you control them? Or they control you? Your experiences, what, did you have a hard life growing up? Did you have a, were you loved or unloved? Those things shape us. Uh, um, uh, your ego, we have a president who, who is clearly an egomaniac, he's a narcissist. How did he get that way? There had to be a reason. And so when you get the E's together, um, uh, that's the education, emotions, experience, oh, your environment. Uh, how many of you in the class are the oldest of the children in your family? We're the oldest, all right? All right, where are the youngest in the family? Okay, where are the middles floating around someplace in there? All right, there are certain combinations which are ideal for long marriages. And some combinations are awful. <laughs> <laughs> Who could think of the worst combinations for a marriage? Two oldest children. Yeah, two oldest. They're both, <laughs> they're, they're both smarter than the other ones. I'm running things, obey me. And then the two youngest, they're very carefree. No one takes out the trash, no one, you know, they slop around. I'll pay the bills sometime soon. They don't worry too much about life. The, the best combination are the oldest marrying the youngest. That's, I lucked out. My wife is the oldest in our family, and she loves giving orders. I don't mind taking them. I go do what I want anyway. So we both get along. Can I tell you one funny story about it? That, uh, uh, I, I met when I came to Washington. I wasn't feeling very well one day, so I went to see the doctor. And he did a little EKG. They hook you up with wires to pretend they're doing something. And uh, uh, <laughs> he said, oh, you're, you're a very sick man. You, you should be in bed with a nurse. <laughs> so the next day I met a nurse, and she was funny, charming, witty, a very caring person. I could tell right away. So I fell in love immediately with her, and four weeks later we were married. And I've been in bed with the nurse ever since. <laughs> so please obey the doctor when you go to the doctor's office, okay? Uh, <laughs> We've been married 102 years. 
51 for my wife, 51 for me. If you're gonna do it, get the full count, okay? I'd like to go back, and maybe the students have some ideas on this. How, how would, I'd like to know, how do we speak to this growing um, group in our country of people who are racist and, and white supremacists and don't like difference, and here at this very diverse college, what do we do about it? And maybe you could start and some of the students could follow and I could get rid of this microphone. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, maybe somebody can tell, uh, maybe somebody can uh, share a story with how you have been victimized by, uh, by, uh, by racial violence or, or gender-based violence uh, and how you deal with that. Because the victimizers are out there, they're still human beings, and how did they get that way? That's the hard part. Does anybody have any stories about it all? Uh, the, the, they can tell us a little bit about it. Uh, Anyone willing to share their experiences? Has anybody here been victimized by economic violence? How many of you have jobs? Quite a few. Do you think you have a fair salary? May I ask how much an hour it is? I get paid, well, I have three jobs. You have three jobs? Yeah. yeah there you are. Um, they're all in the weekends. I do babysitting. Yeah. I work at my parents' bakery, and then I work yeah. here at school. Yeah, there you are. So, yeah. And so that, uh, that, uh, that might, you know, I praise you for doing that. You have a lot of, a lot of energy, and you're helping out your father at the bakery. Yeah. And your mom is working also as a yeah, babysitter. Yeah, she has two talk. jobs too, yeah. doing domestic cleaning and also babysitting. There it is, yeah. there it is. So I do, I do admire you for doing that. Are you the first one in your family to go to college? No, I'm. No, I have my sister. She's going to college. Your sister. Yeah. Yeah. So the two of you are in college. Yeah, and my younger brother also. Yeah, is in there college. you are. So you, yeah. So you, you know, you're doing your parents proud, and, and, and honey, they have a lot to be proud of. Let's give her a nice round of applause. Anyone else willing to share a story, or if you have a question for Coleman? Yes, in the back or over the. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, you are. So I'm Diane. Um, I wanted to battle your question. Uh, can you just restate it? Because I had it in my head and now it's gone. <laughs> um, what do we? How, what do we do about the growing? Um... Racists. You said something about racists, right? You said that this is like a choir. You're preaching to the choir which I totally understand what you're saying, but I agree with you in your comment that you really wouldn't change how you talk because we don't know if everybody, if there is anybody in this room that isn't a racist or we, you don't exactly know where it's coming from or it could be, it's in my classes sometimes, like little comments, it's, it's all over the place, you know? Me and Yesenia actually just came back from Austria. We went to the GCA, yeah. And we went to Dachau, like you were talking about, and we learned so much. It's, it's almost like you can't stop yourself from speaking, but you have to be uh, empathetic towards everybody's feelings in a way so that you can get your voice out there. Not, well, you're gonna offend some people no matter what you say, but try to see it from both sides. Like he said, you, we don't know why President Trump is like this. We don't know why he has narcissistic ways. We don't, we don't know the backstory. And, and anyway, wh why did we even get a president like this? Like, ha we need to question that as well. Like, there's a lot to it. So everything has, like, a reason for it and a backstory. So I feel like you have to put your voice out there and you have to be different. You have to say things that people are not going to like for people to start listening to you. So we can't be so, uh, what's the word, like, scared to to be different, like he said. So yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> sure. We had another quote over here. Yeah, let me. All right, hello, my name is Carlos. So I have a question on, on for yourself. Do you think if people mix more, um, they, won't, they will know the culture and they will, you know, like understand how people, you know, eat food, 
like the kind of food they eat and why they like it. Like, do you think that if people mix more, will it make more people non-racist? I don't know if you understand. Do you know what I mean? Uh, No, like mixed as in like, uh, um, so say you meet a woman, that's what I mean. Like a woman from a different country, oh. that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Intermarriage? Yes, or, yes. So mm -hmm. he's asking if, if dating people outside mm -hmm. of outside of the, mm -hmm. if that's a potential way. I think that's happening more and more. But take a look at what's happened with the, uh, uh, just 15 years ago, uh, I mean, no one was even coming close to approving of gay marriage. Obama said, oh, no, oh, no, no. Uh, uh, he said, that's wrong. And now it's completely turned around. All state governments now approve of gay marriage. And, and, and that was very, that was a rapid event that that happened so quickly. Uh, a look at, a look, Anti-Semitism is still out there. We saw the Charlottesville case where, where Trump said, oh, uh, both sides had good people among them. As, in other words, saying the Nazis were good people. And, and so now have that, that, that kind of talk. We, you know, we got to work a little harder. And, and so it's very hard to come up with a quick solution. But my argument is that we ought to be teaching peace education in our schools. Maybe if we had those neo-Nazis when they were in first grade someplace, or second grade someplace, we have about, we have about 35,000 high schools in this country. We have 78,000 elementary schools and about 6,000 colleges, including the four-year and two-year. The peace education is now in its infancy. It's very hard to crack the high schools because they have all these requirements. They've got STEM. Science, technology, and uh, engineering, and math. I have instead of STEM, I have steps: sociology, theology, ethics, and peace studies. That is steps. Uh, can you get that little sheet of paper that I gave out before? Uh, 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 yeah. There's the one back there. There's a couple of quotes on there. I want to. Uh, uh, so, but the schools are hard to crack. Why is there no peace? studies degree program here at this college. Why isn't there? Well, because maybe not enough professors have demanded it and not enough uh, of the students have said, we want to get a peace studies program here. Yeah. I don't think anybody ought to graduate from college without organizing at least one student strike. You learn a lot about power when you organize a strike. And what should you do? Well, get all your friends together, make your demands known very politely, uh, go to the president of the, of, the, of the college and say, we want to get a degree, co a degree program in peace studies. Well, that's very nice. We're going to form a committee to ponder this issue. Okay, nothing happens. So, the old saying is, in conflict resolution, when the other side does not see the light, make them feel the heat. Mm -hmm. So go on a student strike and lie down every morning and block the faculty parking lot. Make the teachers walk to class. It'll activate their brain cells. Uh, <laughs> so I'm placing my bet on peace education. I, am I getting anywhere? I don't worry, as I said, about being successful. I worry about being faithful. So all of us have to figure out what reform do you really want to see happen in this world and go figure out what gifts I need to make it happen. And it may not be a huge success, just helping, helping like Lily Flores help this one student. Gave her a mop and now she's doing very well as a public interest lawyer. Um, Coleman, uh, can I ask you something? I yeah. just, I imagine with the peace education, because what you teach is so contrary to what we usually learn in schools, sure. how do you react when you get resistance from students? So for instance, when you talk about meat consumption or when you talk yeah. about foreign policy, 
yeah. um, in the United States, we've all been indoctrinated with a certain sure. narrative about sure. our history as Americans. Sure. So that could be really threatening to students if it's sure. the first time they're exposed to this alternative narrative. So yeah. I guess my question is, how much resistance do you get from students, and how do you respond to that resistance? Well, I get criticized uh, for being, uh, for being one-sided. Yeah. I say, no, no, no. This class is the other side. You're, you're getting the side of the argument that violence matters. We have a government committed to violence. We have rampant sexual abuse in our campuses. We have white-collar crime on Wall Street. Uh, I think of all the things that are happening, all these types of violence. So one class is, is hardly enough. Would we ever put you through elementary and middle and high school with only one math class in 12 years? You get it every year, whether you like it or not. Uh, but only one, they're getting one class in one school. It took me seven years to get this, uh, uh, to get this, uh, uh, this book approved by the county school board. As though I was a propagandist going in there with my left-wing views, mm, I'm going to turn them against the government. Uh, no, no, read Martin Luther King, read Gandhi, read Tolstoy. And I think I've seen, I've seen uh, 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 minds have been changed. I've seen it endlessly. Uh, uh, but we, uh, schools have enormous power. This is a government-run school. Isn't this, is, is this a private school or is this a public school? It's part of City University of New York, yeah. so it's public. So this is a government-run school. Governments are fine, but they have agendas. Mm -hmm. They want to turn out a certain kind of people. And so it's very hard to break through that. It's very hard to radicalize. I can get away with it because I'm not paid at my, at my high school, so I can't be fired. I've not been hired. <laughs> uh, there's a nice balance to it. Uh, <laughs> I have a question. I'm, I'm a little confused now. First of all, I'm a lot confused, but all right. High school, what age do you teach the course? I teach all seniors. All seniors? Yeah. Okay. Now, it's, how did you get it into the curriculum? Is it a private school? No, it's public. I, I, was, I went to go uh, give a talk at a public high school right near the White House. Uh, it was a very poor school. Remember I said before? You said uh, there was a rich school and a poor school. Yeah, so yes. I went to the poor school. It was five blocks from, the, uh, from my office and five blocks from the White House. Right. And so the principal said, we can't afford to pay you. And she said, we'd like you to, have, we'd like you to come here and teach a class on writing, because you're a writer. And I said, no, I'd rather teach peace. And okay. that's how it all started in 1982. In fact, I wrote a book on the very title, I'd Rather Teach Peace. And I kept a journal for a whole year. And one year I was teaching seven courses at five different schools. So there's a lot to draw on, but now, I teach... Are the, these electives? In other words, a student had a choice to take it or not take it? At the high school, yes, it's an elective. It's an elective. And the same in college and, and also at, at, at Georgetown Law. Was there any resistance from parents? I teach, and so I'm trying to picture whatever. Was there any resistance from parents? You know, you oh, talk yes. about a strike. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, particularly right before Thanksgiving. Uh-huh when I do about three weeks on animal rights and human wrongs, and I, I like show it. documentaries how the animals are being killed. I've had more moms that say, you know, you ruined our Thanksgiving dinner. I said, I'm happy I did. <laughs> I hope I ruined all your dinners until you become a vegetarian or a vegan. So calm down, mom, come take my class, and I'll and educate did, did you. Did you win them over eventually? Uh, or at least the good part of them? They, <laughs> I don't keep a one-loss record, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, 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 students often have conversions. Mm -hmm. I didn't know animals were treated that way. Mm -hmm. Of course you didn't know. We don't put it on television every night, on primetime television. There are five, uh, the five biggest advertisers with TV commercials. You know, I guess, I guess what companies advertise the most? McDonald's, Purdue, Purdue 
Wendy's, Burger King, and the fourth is, is Miller beer, wash it all down with beer. Uh, but we don't tell you that you're eating dead animal body parts filled with chemicals. That's what a hamburger really is. Uh, so we lie to this, uh, we tell them lies. Uh, those commercials are lying. But it brings money in. Uh, the McDonald's advertising budget is 800 million a year. That's a lot. And this stock is going up again. It's going up. Take a look at the stock market. And look at the big military contractors, Lockheed Martin. They're doing very well. So my last question, I don't need a mic. No, no, that's all right. You said at the beginning that you were a vegetarian. Is that the reason you became? I mean, you're into racing and running. I have sons who are marathon runners, and they don't touch me for different reasons. Sure. Yeah. How about the you can do it for You can do it for health reasons. Uh, you can do it for ethical reasons. You can do it for poverty reasons. You can do it for cruelty, anti-cruelty. Child, since you were young? Well, that took... It took a while to figure all this out. And, and uh, can you, I grew up, like most people, there with pets. And then, and I see, well, why, why am I eating meat? Because uh, uh, these animals have a lot of meat on them. I wouldn't want to have them killed, but someone else does the dirty work uh, at the factory farms. Can I, can I just add something to Yes. Because uh, I worked in a feed uh, company at one time, so I can tell you that uh, animals are fed animals. Yes, so yes, yes. So most of the animals are fed blood meal, bone meal. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're basically recirculating uh, the animal to be eaten by another animal. That's mm -hmm, sure, sure. I uh, wanted to... As I mentioned to you, what I do, I teach Armenian genocide in schools. And uh, it, it's something that people morally, socially, they want to acknowledge, give it the proper acknowledgement. Yet when politics comes into play, they sort of wiggle out of things. And I wanted to ask your uh, point of view on that, because, uh, uh, you know, we want to do what's right, but then I don't think we're either motivated enough or uh, courageous enough to stand up for what we actually believe. So we, uh, we take a step forward, but then we stay two steps back just because there is a bully or there is somebody who is stronger and we, uh, we give up. So what is, what is your thought on that? Well, that's, you know, you can argue that, uh, that, we, that we all have our flaws and, and, and we, don't, we often lack courage. But I think doing the daily things, uh, doing them over and over again, being kind to people, I mean, it sounds ridiculously small. Uh, and we only live, we, we don't, when you look back a billion years ago, we, we're just here for a nanosecond. And so, and so our lives go pretty quickly. If you can help a few people along the way, and uh, that's one of the dark secrets about the peace movement. Many great peacemakers were awful people at home. Mm. Gandhi was an awful husband, awful father. He had four children, never saw them. The oldest son was so angry at his father, always going to prison, going to the salt march. I'm going to get even with my father, he said. He joined the military, and Gandhi did not like it. It, it didn't stop him, so, so the son said, OK, if that didn't wake you up, now I'm really going to show you. He became, he, he took up, he became an alcoholic and a prostitute. Mahatma Gandhi's own son, a Tolstoy, was awful to his wife. I made her bear 13 children. She was constantly depressed. Um, uh, and so Martin Luther King was an awful husband. Uh, hardly knew his children. And he, and he, he he died very disappointed. He was almost clinically depressed. He was criticized by people. Sacrificial. You're sacrificing yourself for the. Sure. They should never have married. 
Yeah, the marriage is the movement. That's fine. But when you have a family, that, that's got to come first. That's got to come first. If you grow up in an unloved family, that is a major handicap. So love your children and just love each other, even though it's a very small circle. Um, Can I just, uh, just to add to that also, one of the themes of the books that uh, Coleman has also is this idea that how do you make peace profitable? I think that what you're talking about is we live in a culture where doing the right thing or promoting peace is not incentivized, so we don't have the same motivation always to stand up for our principles because oftentimes we have something to lose. So part of the movement towards peace building and conflict resolution is how do we make peace as profitable or marketable as the alternative, which unfortunately is violence. And we have a lot of systems and structures in our society that promote violence more than they promote peace building. So that's part of, I would argue, the work as peace educators, for instance. Sure, sure, well said, Isa. Uh, all right, yes, uh, tell us your name again. Uh, my name is Amanda. Amanda. Uh, and so I'm gonna say my concern. And Thank you. Um, I'm gonna voice a concern and then ask a question. Um, so my concern is kind of similar to what we've been talking about, and it's that um, that people are going on to teach peace almost too early, like before they learn peace themselves. And so it becomes another like telling people what to do and I'm doing actions without really understanding the point behind it or not really embodying it. And so I wanted to know, um, my question is, how did you learn peace before you taught peace? Well, I've interviewed so many people who've been victimized by violence. Uh, and I've interviewed them. I, I've taken my class many times in the death row. I teach death penalty law. And so we went and talked to the prisoners. Now we got on a big bus from down to the state prison in Virginia about a three hour trip, and going down on the bus, half the people were pro-death penalty. After we went down and lunch with the inmates and, and spent a day on death row having a seminar, nobody coming home was for the death penalty. They saw really what's, what, what's really happening here. Okay, they did horrible deeds, but they're still human beings. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's one form of education, but we don't know what goes on in our prisons. Does anybody come from a family where you have a relative in prison? Well, yeah. We have 4% uh, of the Earth's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. We love locking people up. It's, uh, I, I think, is that piece in the back, how I just, uh, that post article? Yeah, I left a piece out back there before. I have a friend who I've been working on his case for a long time, and we, and we finally got him out of prison after 38 years for a crime he didn't commit. He's it's the recovery. Washington Post piece yeah. that was in the back, if any of yeah. you want a copy. Yeah, pick it up, yeah, yeah. Now, what, are, what, what are you studying in school, Samantha? Is it Amanda or Samantha? Amanda. Amanda, yes. What are you studying? Uh, thank you. I'm studying liberal arts right now, and then I would like to go into social work. Yeah, there you are. You, 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 uh, that is a caring profession. And it, it doesn't pay an enormous amount of money, but it pays an enormous amount of satisfaction. When, when you thank somebody for helping them, uh, I, I, I think that's a great reward. Um, Yes. Thank you so much. I, I want to respond to Amanda, is it, your, your, your concern about, um, and maybe to follow up with a question to you. You said something about um, a concern about people that don't have maybe an education or what, maybe didn't use that word, but they don't know peace. How, does, how did Coleman experience? experience it and, and how do you get it? And I think that goes back to what I think I hear Coleman saying is the need to have that education in schools, right? To have that peace literacy sure. so that 
so that the educational piece goes alongside with the, the activist piece. Um, and I guess that brings me to another question, but I, I appreciated your question because it made me really stop and think. Um, and I wanted to ask you, where did that concern come from? If you could. Um, I feel like I've been a part of different organizations. Um, some that are doing better than others uh, in terms of embodying what they're teaching and embodying nonviolence, embodying um, peaceful practices. And uh, some, some I feel like because they haven't experienced peace, they haven't experienced harmony in themselves or their families, um, they end up using the same tactics as people who are violent, except they're using different words. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're using rhetoric and I don't think they do it on purpose. It's not this is not something that's to demonize them, it's just that they have not experienced it and so they're coming up aggressive and I'm gonna feel the other myself. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think you, you, you can make the case that we see this at every level. Even UN peacekeeping teams are not perfect, right? We've heard of instances where they've committed some of the same crimes that they're, that they're intervening to um, prevent um, or to stop. So that was a, I thought that was a great question. And I think it just comes back to, Coleman, what you're advocating, which is peace literacy K through 12 plus. But my question back to you is how do we make that happen in a, in, a, in a world where, or at least, I'll just speak for Nassau County because that's where I teach and work and live, um, where the budget is shrinking sure. for support of the humanities. Sure, um, yeah. And I just wonder, are you part of a, a system that I could learn about that, that, that's approaching uh, board of eds in your, in, in your area and, and throughout the country, how, how can we, maybe with the help of, I don't know, PJSA or, you know, how do, how do we have a more strategic approach um, to systematizing peace education? Not just at colleges, which is happening, right? Yeah. But K through 12, how do we do it? <laughs> well, we see one movement now with the Never Again movement organized by those people from Parkland High School and they're educating people, they're far more than what I've been doing. But these events, plus the, the, plus the sexual predator movement, uh, not me movement, that didn't happen because some, it happened because victims finally spoke up and said, no more, never again. And that's the same with the Holocaust, never again. We have to, that's what this whole center is about. It could happen again. And, 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 and so we all, now we all feel very frustrated. There's a wonderful quote here by the little sheet of paper I gave you. Does everybody have this one by I.F. Stone? The only kinds of fights worth having are those you're going to lose. Because somebody has to fight them and lose and lose and lose until someday somebody who believes as you do wins. For somebody to win an important major fight 100 years from now, a lot of other people have to be willing to go right ahead and fight knowing you're gonna lose. So everybody go out and become losers, okay? Uh, Anyone need copies of what he's looking at? That's a great quote, because we we're all raised to win. Oh, you gotta, you gotta be a winner, gotta be a winner. It probably won't happen, and, and, and there's so many things you want to happen now, it won't happen in our lifetimes. But do what you can right now, and, and just take a look at that quote right there. And then also see the one in the square, the middle of the square right there, by Hannah Arendt, a Jewish philosopher who wrote about the Holocaust. Violence, like all action, changes the world but the most probable change is to a more violent world. And we keep hearing from politicians, one more, one more invasion will bring about peace. One more slap in my kid, he or she'll do their homework. And we keep using violence to think it's gonna bring about a peaceful end. It hasn't happened and never will happen. So do we have any more questions or comments at all? Uh, yes. So I have a question in regards to peace studies. Now, is this an actual major in some schools? 
There are about 70 colleges with the major now. Colgate has one, Boulder, Colorado has one, Notre Dame has one, University of San Diego has one. Does your school have one? Do you want to share what you're doing? Just briefly. <laughs> I developed a course at Nassau Community College called An Introduction to Peace Studies. So we offer that course. And the only reason I asked you that tough question that I didn't mean to was no, no. Is because I am yeah. feeling some frustration because I have a whole program in my back pocket that I've been working on really hard during my sabbatical, yeah. and during which I met Ozzy and saw you speak as well yeah. at David Smith's conference. Sure. But it was not it was not passed. And I had no problem with the Peace Studies 101, but there's a there's a general um, I think skepticism yeah. on the part of the college about who will enroll in this program, um, sure. what will it lead to? And, and so David Smith's been helping me out a lot with uh, trying to inform our college about that there's so many majors you can, not, you don't have to go to the UN and do diplomacy, you can actually bring peace studies into nursing and into environmental studies and into all disciplines, uh, really, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. About peace studies is because I wanted to know where can it lead to, which is exactly what you were talking about. Where can you go from there? And just to add to that, in my experience as a psychologist, peace studies so far has also been very interdisciplinary. So there's a lot of different majors which can develop into pathways to being exposed to peace studies or peace education. So you don't necessarily need to major in it to end up doing work in it or get exposed to the courses. But as Coleman mentioned, there are now are colleges that are explicitly offering degree programs in it if you wanted to go in that direction as well. Yeah. Look up, Google the name David Smith, because he wrote a book on... Uh, peace Jobs is the name. Yeah, Peace Jobs. Because usually mom or dad would say, how are you going to get a job as a peacemaker? Uh, uh, go major in engineering. And, and so you, you get pressure from the parents. But everybody wants to lead a peaceful life. Learn how to do it with your own family first. We have high rates of domestic violence in our society. Look at, look at all these men that have been brought down that you know, you know, have been sexually you know, predator. Matt Lauer, Al Franken, Bill O'Reilly, now uh, Donald Trump's turn is coming. It's coming. Bill Cosby recently. Bill Cosby found guilty. Finally. Yeah, yeah, finally. And, and all those women that that, that guy hurt. And uh, uh, so the time is happening. So you can look, and those are very positive events. But they got to be backed up by the schools that really study it academically. So you get some real grounding. It's not just emotionals. It's also intellectual power. Mm -hmm. um, Any other questions from the audience for Coleman? Just before you go, if anybody comes to take my class at American U at Georgetown, you have a guaranteed A. <laughs> Autom automatic A's. And then just before we go, I, I interviewed a mother, uh, um, a Teresa one time, and just about a month, about two months before she passed away, she gave me a little piece of paper. And uh, where's that book? Is that book going around someplace? Uh, uh, there it is. Yeah. It, it's, in, it's in chapter four, entitled, How Does Goodness Happen? You ever wondered about that? You, meet, you say, there is a good person. How'd they get that way? And she gave it to me, all wrinkled up, said, put it in your next book. I, I said, I will do it. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people may accuse you of selfish motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you may win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten by tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty will make you vulnerable. Be honest anyway. What you spend years building up may be torn down overnight. Build anyway. People who really want help may attack you if you help them. Help them anyway. And finally, give the world the best you have and you make it hurt. Give the world your best anyway. 
try to remember those words of inspiration because when the hills get steep and the cold wind blows against us, you may be tempted to run out, give out, wear out, or worst of all, sell out. And if you care about and making a few changes in your life to become better peacemakers, and all of us can do that. There's only one word that really matters when you think about it. It's a simple, sacred, one-syllable word. Start. Start. Thank you very much. Let's stay in touch, and Thank bless you. you all. Thank you very much.